It's a match made in Marineland. The first time she set eyes on him, she was absolutely smitten. Smooshy is a walrus who lives at Niagara Falls, Marineland. You were a trainer at one time at Marineland. You're known as the walrus whisperer. The only way to do a story like Marineland is to have an insider. That was Phil DeMers, the first whistleblower. I was witness to things that people would never imagine. In response, Marineland's head veterinarian insisted the animals there are well taken care of. That was the choice. Walk away, move on, and look the other way, or save Smooshy. Exposing everything. It's so important. You see the old man here? He's around. For a while, Marineland's owner sought to intimidate us by driving by our house and stalking us. John Haller founded Marineland in 1961. It's a hobby. It's a hobby. <laughs> yeah. They sued me for a million five. They sued my girlfriend. They sued other activists. They sued newspapers. They, they're suing everybody. You don't endure what I've done for as many years as I have with people hiding behind money to try to crush me. I hate to see somebody ruined over their beliefs. Just f tell these guys, save the f headache. Give me the f walrus and that's it. If I can get Smooshy's story out, they have to provide for her better care. Police got a call from Marineland expressing some concern. I am the creation that Marineland hoped to never create. I am their worst nightmare. The, the picture's revealing itself here, and it's exactly my worst nightmare, a conclusion. Who am I going to be without a fight? Hello, 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 Cape Cod and beyond. My guest today is international award-winning director and producer, Natalie Bibo. And today we are discussing her latest documentary, The Walrus and the Whistleblower, about walrus whisperer Phil Demers and his journey to expose the abuses at Marine Land, a marine theme park in Niagara Falls. Her work includes Africa on the Move, Sugar Coated, Canada of People's History and Keeping Canada Alive. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. So I love your documentary. And, um, you know, I'm just curious what the first seed of inspiration behind the project was. Well, the origin story of this film um, is actually uh, an exercise in finding my own voice. I worked in television and in long form documentary for about 15 years before starting this project. But I was always working on projects that were uh, conceived uh, by other people. Uh, I worked inside the Canadian uh, Broadcasting Corporation, working on in-house documentaries there. And then I went freelance and joined um, independent film teams and uh, directed high profile documentary series. Um, but I longed to create a project of my own that had a closer personal connection and that would allow me to exercise more of an artistic voice, to step out of this straighter journalism that I'd been doing. And so this story, um, this battle between Phil and Marine Land, and also this, uh, the issue of marine mammal captivity, I'd been following it for a long time but had not and you know it's one of those things where i almost feel like the universe conspired to actually give me this project to be able to exercise my voice in this way because it's a film that has been living inside of me for many more years uh before i i pitched it and actually made it um i had to um find the courage to do it for a variety of reasons that i can talk about um but it, it wasn't until uh, the issue landed in our nation's capital and we had a law that was in the uh, process of being passed to ban the captivity of marine mammals that made me think I could actually take this story and do what I wanted with it. Yeah, very cool. Well, it's interesting because, you know, I've seen The Cove and Blackfish and uh, Sea of Shadows and um, uh, I'm thinking, is there another one that I was thinking of? Um, and, 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 you know, it, it's a fascinating thing. It's a very fascinating theme. And I loved, 
how your story is very, very personal. And it's very like, it's a very, like you mentioned, it's a messy human fable to me. And it's like, I think that describes it really well because there's so many things when you, when you get to know someone's ego, you know, there's so many complications and even, um, John Holler, who is the owner of the Marine park, we can sympathize with him to some extent to kind of, we get a worldview into not only his ki kindness, despite his systemic abuses, um, which I think he just thinks are, are, are ab an absolute necessity and in a way they might be, you know, and so to, to, to some extent, um, uh, but it's really fascinating to see, to get a window into his personality because he's like this, you know, Transylvanian former circus, like carnival, you know, uh, uh, trainer. And, you know, he's like, either if he's not gun toting, he, he pretends to be. <laughs> so it's just, right? yeah, indeed. <laughs> And, so, and then we see the complexities of Phil, who's really captivating, and and also his extrovertedness as the walrus whisperer, and to see his relationships with social media and how that influences things. Because for four generations, people have been protesting, um, mm -hmm. you know, protesting this. So, can you talk about your approach in terms of filmmaking, like? Um, how it, it seems like you you spent a great deal of time shooting. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you, um, you know, what your approach is in terms of how to per personalize it? Because we get a very creative, artistic vision cin cinematically in terms of you know the imagery um, that you chose, and it's very personal. So can you talk about about your approach? Yes, that's a great um, uh, question because, and I, I'm really glad to hear that you um, have picked up on some of these nuances and the type of storytelling that I wanted to put out into the world. Um, because, uh, I mean, in large part, because of my own personal interests, um, which are around this messy humanity that I observe all around me, um, we all do. We are all egoic creatures to some degree, um, but seeing this um, story where the egos in this story are so overdeveloped and potentially unobserved um, was the most fascinating thing for me to get into, um, also because it uh, was going to create a film that was different than the other films that exist in this space. So when we think about animal rights films, if we can call this one that, um, which, you know, it, it is in part, but it's also in part about many other things. Um, the Cove and Blackfish and other documentaries about um, veganism or, or other types of animal rights um, treat their subject very differently. And so what I wanted to do was come at this from a fresh um, place and look at this uh, character and create a character driven film that uh, went behind the battle lines of a very famous story and uh, something that's playing out on social media, but also pick up on the hubris that exists on all sides. And um, hopefully reveal that to the audience in an elegant but subtle way um, <clears throat> because the cause is also important you know so it was a very difficult filmmaking process for me and, an, and a very difficult editing process to take over 200 hours of material you know i followed this story for two years filmed a ton i collected a lot of archives and um had to fashion this narrative in the edit suite with uh, the material that I had before me um, in a way that could uh, uh, make sing these universal themes of justice and uh, exposing wrongs while also um, weaving together this underlying human fable aspect where we see uh, flaws in everyone um, and heroic uh, noble gestures in, in almost everyone as well, you know? And so uh, the approach was uh, deeply psychological, personal and difficult for me, deeply challenging to exercise new muscles in this way and also to be um, in the space of these very strong obsessive characters who, on both sides of this battle um, have really 
taken this on so personally and who exist in part just to vindicate themselves or ju just to put forward their view of, of the world um, in an uncompromising, sometimes um, not compassionate way. So it was um, fascinating for me to see the tension and the contradictions in the story and to try to play with that in the film and show the beauty of these characters and also the, the ugliness as well. Yes, and you know, much has been said of if you if you don't have, you know, uh, ha depression or sadness or anxiety or all the negative human emotions, right, negative human experience to contrast happiness with, there is no happiness because we need that contrast. And so the play of dark and light and heavy and, and, and vibrant and um, the, all the dimensions of, of the ego actually I think as a viewer is more rewarding um, than something that has more like of a one note kind of thing that something that's more clinical or objective like you kind of get the f it, it I don't know how to explain it but for me it felt like it was we're witnessing it as a friend or we're witnessing it you know what I mean like a friend that is like the, the ear to cry like the shoulder to cry on <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so it, it had a really interesting, like a personal essay kind of tone, but, but there's still the journalistic aspect in it that was woven through too. So I'm curious, like, because you were in these people's lives and I feel like they were very natural and partly, you know, Phil Demers, you know, very intense, uh, obsessive. <laughs> I mean, I, I per personally, I think it's it's a very empathetic, you know, a person can feel very empathetic because it, everyone has their own sense of righteousness. Um, and sometimes we really have to have that kind of single minded focus and, and drive and drive to create and, you know, so and it's really con contrasted with the acquiescence or at least I don't know, maybe that's the wrong word of his partner, who's also a former trainer and her experience of it and her, you just, you know, it's, it's very, I don't know. I felt like it was very nuanced and very poetic the, 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 and very feminine. Like he's very, she's very into his yet, you know? Yet. Yes. yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, absolutely. Um, so, so folks should go and see it. And um, yeah, I mean, I just, uh, it, it was really interesting to 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 see the relationship of like uh, members of Congress with with uh, you know with the owner and all of that. So folks should check it out. And then um, I see, I saw I saw Sugar Coated, which you had co-produced, and it's really an incredible story about how public opinion on sugar was manipulated over the decades by the sugar industry. And I just wanted to you know just. Uh, a couple words from you on that like regarding the project how how was that experience because we're all so affected by what we eat and we all know that we have a relationship with sugar at least most of us do mm -hmm, absolutely. <laughs> well it's another iconic thing in our society right when we think about the idea of marine mammals doing shows it's 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 uh it's an endemic part or it has been until recently of our upbringing our culture the way we think about our our ch child hood in terms of joy and all of that um and sugar is uh similar you know it's sort of a symbol of uh joy and celebration and easing of pain through comfort and all these things and so to think of it as this little evil devil that causes all these problems in our health um and also to think about the system behind the sugar industry that that does the same um that experience for me was formative working on that film i mean the context is that i had left my um uh, staff job at the cbc um where i was making in-house documentaries to working freelance and so i got connected to michelle Hoser and Janice Dahl who had created this project and to work with those two formidable women um, to make this film was well is the reason I was able to have the courage to then pitch my own project and make the walrus and the whistleblower um, watching them in that three-year odyssey and working closely with them on creating this narrative and exposing this abuse of power that we've seen in our society around sugar consumption around the lobbying of uh, the sugar industry uh, was such a gift. I mean, we all worked our little butts off, um, as I did on the Walrus film. Um, but um, 
uh, but it, you know, it's a very different film, right? It's, it's, uh, it has also the, this aspect of journalism. It's less character driven. You know, we're, we're really looking at the issue. Um, Michelle, who edited the film, did an amazing job of uh, weaving in beautiful archive and um, animated graphics to bring sugar to life in a way so we could really connect with the topic. Um, so I learned a lot from that project and, uh, and was able to, you know, it was part, as with all things in life, you know, we, we have these life experiences that lead us to other things and that help us grow as individuals. And that was a big stepping stone um, in my career, but also in my approach to storytelling. You know, I learned a lot and, uh, and was able to, yeah, go on and make this film. And, and going back to the walrus um, and the whistleblower, how did you, how, did you, because you said you were you uh, learning new muscles, like I would think that at some point you might feel like you were almost inundated too much in the pers their personal lives. Like it, I would think that because you're telling an emotional, character-driven story, that you need to kind of use your heart and your emotions to navigate that space. You need to use your intuition because it's it's so not a clinical thing. Like so, um, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. You wanted sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. I'm just, I'm just kind of wondering about that experience. Like, um, what did you learn from it that you're going to take to your next work? Ooh, I could <laughs> write a book about that. <laughs> I might write a book about that. Um, uh, you know, I actually, I, 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 I almost tear up at, at the thought of that question um, because I am. Uh, generally speaking, a heart driven person, you know, I lead with that and I, I lead with intuition, um, which has a certain amount of, um, uh, there's an, uh, an impulsiveness there, you know, that is mitigated by my training as a, a journalist. Um, but I am in my core, someone who wants to tell fantastic, surrealistic, um, nuanced, rich, messed up stories because that's how I see the world. Um, and so when I imagine myself in the kitchen of Phil and Christine, you know, the scene that you bring up in the film where we're really seeing layers and layers of human dynamics at play, and then trying to craft that into a three to four minute scene so that people can get what I was feeling in that scene, um, which is a whole bunch of contradictory emotions, contradictory thoughts, various narratives colliding all into each other in the bastion of this, these people's homes. Um, the skill it took <laughs> and the, the, dig, the, the, the digging into the soul it took to try to do that justice, you know, and I still, I'm too close to it. I don't know if I did it justice. I really hope I did. And I hope that the audience feels that way. Um, but I worked very hard at trying to tease out those emotions and creating um, overall an empathetic story, you know, so that we could feel connected to every single person we meet here. Um, because everyone has been affected, everyone has made mistakes, everyone has hurt other people. And, and I think that um, the, 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 you know, when you asked me what I learned, I learned how to try to balance that heart with distance, with trying to observe myself as well as the person observing and what my own reactions to that were and trying to step out of it while being so intimately connected. I mean, this is also remember a story that's playing out in my hometown about a guy I knew when I was a kid who's still friends with my brother, um, who um, I had to have very close contact with throughout the making of this film to be able to tell the story. Um, and then getting involved and knowing all these peripheral characters and um, having the opinions of other people in the town on him, um, which is you know pretty controversial. You know, there's good, there's bad, there's ugly. Um, when we think about the reputation of John Holler, there's good, there's bad, there's ugly. Um, and so going home to a place, you know, that I left 20 years ago to try to bathe in all of this and then come out the other side, try to look at it from a distance and collect, um, to take the heart, but synthesize it and, and try to tell a clear narrative with it was something I had never done before. So when I talk about new muscles, that's, that's a big one. Um, and I hope that I succeeded so that I can try to use that muscle again for a different story. 
Well, I think you really succeeded and uh, I encourage everyone to go see the walrus and the whistleblower. Um, you have a website and folks can find out through it where it is um, showing and playing. And right now there's um, lots of opportunities. It's um, at different, um, I think online film festivals or different venues. There's <laughs> yeah, yeah, the easiest place right now is on iTunes um, and Amazon. Uh, that's where it is uh, playing primarily right now, but it is still doing the festival circuit. And um, uh, I regret not being able to physically be present for these things, um, but I hope that th the festival run that's picking up in the spring uh, will have some opportunities for me to travel with the film a little bit, maybe, and actually have audience engagement. But, um, but yeah, it, it's out there. Yes. Thank you so much, Natalie Bivo, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Pandora. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. So thank you so much. I, I just, I think it's so marvelous. And um, wow. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing your further work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I just have to say, I really appreciate your um, uh, kindness last week. Uh, it really uh, marked me and I'll always remember that, um, connecting to that. And your um, uh, just general way of being in this interview, it, it meant a lot to me. It's really one of my favorite experiences. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like I learned so much from the way that you did your storytelling. Mm. It's, it really touched me and um, I had to see it again to yeah, and I, yeah, and I think like you know that is one thing actually that uh, I w I would want to take to another film is that I think for some viewers the nuances are lost because they 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 may have been too subtle because I I felt them so, and I can tell you you feel them and you see them and there are many other people who do but there are many who don't you know there are many who really see this as a more binary straight kind of David and Goliath story and it is. <laughs> Not, D David is not always David and Goliath is not always Goliath. And so I, it's really for a sophisticated viewer, but I appreciate that you, you are one of them. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really, you know, be responsible for people's interpretation. It just, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, finding out, you know, for us in America, how many people voted for Trump, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know they're they're interpreting things that we're that other folks are interpreting in a completely different way. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, and that's art, right? That's that's story. So I would just keep on your course and not worry too much about yeah. people's interpretations. And yeah. and you know what? I you know I'm a very spiritual person, and I feel like people are growing and people are waking up. And so people may return. You may be planting seeds where people return to see that film, and they're like, oh, and they. They get they get something different out of it. They yeah. get the more yeah. nuances. Yeah, you know, I hope so. And they change and grow. You know. Yeah. No, it's very true. It's very true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what's so amazing about film is that it does really have the power to be like to give people a new interpretation and some new tools to to see things in a different way. So. Yes. No. Yeah. Exactly. And I think it's uh, and you see films sometimes at the wrong moment in your life and sometimes at the right moment in your life, you know, or you read a book or whatever it is. And so I'm, I feel very privileged to be in this world where um, it's industry where we can put things out there and then they have a life of their own after that, you know, and then you don't, you know, someone said to me, a filmmaker friend said to me, you know, once you make your baby, you have to let the baby go and the baby goes out into the world and it grows up and it does what it's going to do. And you've done your best to shepherd it and protect it and, you know, do all the things. But once it goes out into the world, it's, it's actually not yours anymore. It, it belongs to everyone who participates in receiving it. And um, that's another thing I'm learning from making such a personal film. But um, yeah, it's fascinating, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. And, and I, I've ju I was just reading this book till way too late this morning about, um, it, but written by these two guys who, um, I think they're a couple. And so it's really kind of fascinating that they wrote this thing together and they both studied uh, Christianity and um, they have very sort of, they really look at the, I've read other books, similar books, but this really, they're not really indoctrinated in the Christian doctrines and they're looking at the real, you know, holistic, um, Hellenistic and Judaic and and uh, very pagan roots and influences from possibly Buddhism and and all that and it's a very it's a it's really focused on Gnosticism mm. and the the really the allegorical uh, telling and 
interpreting what are miracles as signs, which is the more the literal interpretation of Jesus's miracles. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there's a literalist interpretation, there's material science, and there's the little or literal interpretation of the Bible versus a very metaphorical interpretation, mm -hmm. um, which has a lot of nuances and a lot of different, lay, you know, a lot of different uh, layers. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, it's really, <laughs> it's really a different, it's a really different way to interpret the, these ancient gospels. And some, some of these books from the Gnostics are only now being, you know, and since the seventies and uh, being revealed and, and interpreted in new ways. So I'm just kind of thinking that your film that, you know, there's kind of like, uh, in writing, it's like the spiritual text of the story, which is like the, what you don't actually tell. It's like the, you know, the, the negative space. And, and that's the space where you just really experience. Mm -hmm. You experience the story and you interpret the story. And that space needs to be there because I think what we do is we telegraph everything in our, cult, you know, I mean, I think can Canadian culture in some ways very different, <laughs> but in some ways very similar, right? So yeah. Yeah. What we do is in the Western world is we tend to like color in like, you know, it's like color in the whole page, kids, color it, color, color, color. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. yeah I love that. For you. So, yeah, I love that. So you're trying to tell a more personal story that allows people to not just see what's the concreteness. It's, it's, yeah. So it's, it's kind of like, I'm seeing it as Gnostic, like Gnosticism. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. It's like, it's the cracks in between, you know? Um, it's, um, you know, one, one, of the, one of my favorite um, uh, uh, notes I got after releasing the film from friends is that one of them said to me, my favorite thing about the film was what you didn't say and what you made me feel. And she didn't use the word negative space, but I, I imagine that's yeah. what she meant. And um, Again, this is for a, 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 an, a, a, an evolving person who can feel, who has the space in themselves to feel that or is receptive to that. But um, it's such a joy to speak to someone who, who does because it's, um, it's so rich, right? That's where life is. That's where the, the messiness is and all that. It's really, and that's where we grow um, yeah. in observing that, you know? Yeah.